The Old Curiosity Shop by Charles Dickens Chapter 22 The remainder of that day, and the whole of the next, were a busy time for the Nubbles family, to whom everything connected with Kit's outfit and departure was matter of as great moment as if he had been about to penetrate into the interior of Africa, or to take a cruise round the world. It would be difficult to suppose that there ever was a box which was opened and shut so many times within four-and-twenty hours as that which contained his wardrobe and necessaries, and certainly there never was one which to two small eyes presented such a mine of clothing as this mighty chest with its three shirts and proportionate allowance of stockings and pocket-handkerchiefs disclosed to the astonished vision of little Jacob. At last it was conveyed to the carrier's, at whose house at Finchley Kit was to find it next day. And the box being gone, there remained but two questions for consideration. Firstly, whether the carrier would lose, or dishonestly feign to lose, the box upon the road. Secondly, whether Kit's mother perfectly understood how to take care of herself in the absence of her son. "'I don't think there's hardly a chance of his really losing it, but carriers are under great temptation to pretend they lose things, no doubt,' said Mrs. Nubbles, apprehensively, in reference to the first point. "'No doubt about it,' returned Kit, with a serious look. "'Upon my word, mother, I don't think it was right to trust it to itself. Somebody ought to have gone with it, I'm afraid.' "'We can't help it now.' said his mother, but it was foolish and wrong. People oughtn't to be tempted. Kit inwardly resolved that he would never tempt a carrier any more, save with an empty box, and having formed this Christian determination, he turned his thoughts to the second question. "'You know, you must keep up your spirits, mother, and not be lonesome, because I'm not at home.' I shall very often be able to look in when I come into town, I dare say, and I shall send you a letter sometimes, and when the quarter comes round, I can get a holiday, of course, and then see if we don't take little Jacob to the play, and let him know what oysters means. I hope plays mayn't be sinful, Kit, but I'm almost afraid, said Mrs. Nubbles. I know who's been putting that into your head rejoined her son disconsolately. That's little Bethel again. Now I say, mother, pray don't take to go in there regularly. For if I was to see your good-humoured face that has always made home cheerful turn into a grievous one, and the baby trained to look grievous too, and to call itself a young sinner, bless its heart, and a child of the devil, which is calling its dead father names, "'If I was to see this, and see little Jacob looking grievous likewise, "'I should so take it to heart that I'm sure I should go and list for a soldier, "'and run my head on purpose against the first cannon-ball I saw come in my way. "'Oh, Kit, don't talk like that. "'I would indeed, mother, and unless you want to make me feel very wretched and uncomfortable, "'you'll keep that bow on your bonnet, which you'd more than half a mind to pull off last week.' "'Can you suppose there any harm in looking as cheerful and being as cheerful "'as our poor circumstances will permit? "'Do I see anything in the way I'm made "'which calls upon me to be a snivelling, solemn, whispering chap, "'sneaking about as if I couldn't help it "'and expressing myself in a most unpleasant snaffle? "'On the contrary, don't I see every reason why I shouldn't? "'Just hear this!' <laughs> And that is natural as walking, and is good for the health. <laughs> and that is natural as a sheep's bleating, or a pig's grunting, or a horse's neighing, or a bird's singing. <laughs> Isn't it, Mother? <laughs> there was something contagious in Kit's laugh, for his mother, who had looked grave before, first subsided into a smile, and then fell to joining in it heartily, which occasioned Kit to say that he knew it was natural, and to laugh the more. Kit and his mother, laughing together in a pretty loud key, woke the baby, 
who, finding that there was something very jovial and agreeable in progress, was no sooner in its mother's arms than it began to kick and laugh most vigorously. This new illustration of his argument so tickled Kit that he fell backward in his chair in a state of exhaustion, pointing at the baby and shaking his sides till he rocked again. After recovering twice or thrice, and as often relapsing, he wiped his eyes and said grace, and a very cheerful meal their scanty supper was. With more kisses and hugs and tears than many young gentlemen who start upon their travels and leave well-stocked homes behind them would deem within the bounds of probability, if matter so low could be herein set down, Kit left the house at an early hour next morning, and set out to walk to Finchley, feeling a sufficient pride in his appearance to have warranted his excommunication from Little Bethel from that time forth, if he had ever been one of that mournful congregation. Lest anybody should feel a curiosity to know how Kit was clad, it may be briefly remarked that he wore no livery, but was dressed in a coat of pepper and salt, with waistcoat of canary colour, and nether garments of iron grey. Besides these glories, he shone in the lustre of a new pair of boots, and an extremely stiff and shiny hat, which on being struck anywhere with the knuckles sounded like a drum. And in this attire, rather wondering that he attracted so little attention, and attributing the circumstance to the insensibility of those who got up early, he made his way towards Abel Cottage. Without encountering any more remarkable adventure on the road, and meeting a lad in a brimless hat, the exact counterpart of his old one, on whom he bestowed half the sixpence he possessed, Kit arrived in course of time at the carrier's house, where, to the lasting honour of human nature, he found the box in safety. Receiving from the wife of this immaculate man a direction to Mr. Garland's, he took the box upon his shoulder, and repaired thither directly. To be sure, it was a beautiful little cottage, with a thatched roof, and little spires at the gable ends, and pieces of stained glass in some of the windows, almost as large as pocket-books. On one side of the house was a little stable, just the size for the pony, with a little room over it, just the size for Kit. White curtains were fluttering, and birds in cages that looked as bright as if they were made of gold, were singing at the windows. Plants were arranged on either side of the path, and clustered about the door, and the garden was bright with flowers in full bloom, which shed a sweet odour all round, and had a charming and elegant appearance. Everything within the house and without seemed to be the perfection of neatness and order. In the garden there was not a weed to be seen, and to judge from some dapper gardening tools, a basket, and a pair of gloves which were lying in one of the walks, old Mr. Garland had been at work in it that very morning. Kit looked about him, and admired, and looked again, and this a great many times before he could make up his mind to turn his head another way, and ring the bell. There was abundance of time to look about him again, though, when he had rung it, for nobody came, so after ringing it twice or thrice, he sat down upon his box, and waited. He rang the bell a great many times, and yet nobody came. But at last, as he was sitting upon the box, thinking about giants' castles, and princesses tied up to pegs by the hair of their heads, and dragons bursting out from behind gates, and other incidents of the like nature, common in story-books to youths of low degree on their first visit to strange houses, the door was gently opened, and a little servant-girl, very tidy, modest, and demure, but very pretty, too, appeared. "'I suppose you're Christopher, sir,' said the servant-girl. Kit got off the box, and said yes, he was. "'I'm afraid you've rung a good many times, perhaps,' she rejoined. "'But we couldn't hear you, because we've been catching the pony.' Kit rather wondered what this meant. But as he couldn't stop there, asking questions, he shouldered the box again, and followed the girl into the hall, where, through a back door, he descried Mr. Garland leading Whisker in triumph up the garden, after that self-willed pony had, as he afterwards learnt, dodged the family round a small paddock in the rear for one hour and three quarters. The old gentleman received him very kindly, and so did the old lady 
whose previous good opinion of him was greatly enhanced by his wiping his boots on the mat until the soles of his feet burnt again. He was then taken into the parlour to be inspected in his new clothes, and when he had been surveyed several times, and had afforded by his appearance unlimited satisfaction, he was taken into the stable, where the pony received him with uncommon complacence, and thence into the little chamber he had already observed, which was very clean and comfortable, and thence into the garden, in which the old gentleman told him he would be taught to employ himself, and where he told him, besides, what great things he meant to do to make him comfortable and happy, if he found he deserved it. All these kindnesses Kit acknowledged with various expressions of gratitude, and so many touches of the new hat, that the brim suffered considerably. When the old gentleman had said all he had to say in the way of promises and advice, and Kit had said all he had to say in the way of assurance and thankfulness, he was handed over again to the old lady, who, summoning the little servant-girl, whose name was Barbara, instructed her to take him downstairs and give him something to eat and drink after his walk. Downstairs, therefore, Kit went, and at the bottom of the stairs there was such a kitchen as was never before seen or heard of out of a toy-shop window, with everything in it as bright and glowing, and as precisely ordered, too, as Barbara herself. And in this kitchen Kit sat himself down at a table as white as a tablecloth, to eat cold meat, and drink small ale, and use his knife and fork, the more awkwardly, because there was an unknown Barbara looking on, and observing him. It did not appear, however, that there was anything remarkably tremendous about this strange Barbara, who, having lived a very quiet life, blushed very much, and was quite as embarrassed and uncertain what she ought to say or do, as Kit could possibly be. When he had sat for some little time, attentive to the ticking of the sober clock, he ventured to glance curiously at the dresser, and there, among the plates and dishes, were Barbara's little work-box, with a sliding lid to shut in the balls of cotton, and Barbara's prayer-book, and Barbara's hymn-book, and Barbara's Bible. Barbara's little looking-glass hung in a good light near the window, and Barbara's bonnet was on a nail behind the door. From all these mute signs and tokens of her presence, he naturally glanced at Barbara herself, who sat as mute as they, shulling peas into a dish. And just when Kit was looking at her eyelashes and wondering, quite in the simplicity of his heart, what colour her eyes might be, it perversely happened that Barbara raised her head a little to look at him, when both pair of eyes were hastily withdrawn, and Kit leant over his plate, and Barbara over her pea-shells, each in extreme confusion at having been detected by the other. End of chapter 22